James Kenneth Glassman is a graduate of Harvard University where he was also the managing editor of the Harvard Crimson. Since then, he has helmed the Atlantic Monthly, The New Republic, and served as executive vice president of U.S. News and World Report. Along the way, he has also had a column in the business section of the Washington Post. In 2007, he was nominated by then-President George W. Bush to be Under Secretary of State. Today, James Glassman is, uh, well, he's actually the uh, former founding member of the uh, George W. Bush Institute, a public policy development institution. We are pleased to have you on the program Thanks, today. Uh, well, first off, describe to me what the George W. Bush Institute does. Sure. Every president since Franklin Roosevelt has had a library. Everybody knows what a presidential library is. It's, it's, a, it's a museum and it's a repository for papers. President Bush wanted to have something a little bit different, which mm -hmm. is an institute, a policy institute, sort of like a think tank mm -hmm. that is part of the library complex. So we actually started work a little over four years ago. The building itself wasn't finished until April. And um, my job was to set it up, and I did that over four years. We operate in six different areas, ranging from education reform to global health, where we've got a big project in Africa, mm -hmm. saving women's lives from cancer. And uh, these are things that President Bush is, is interested in, wants to devote most of his uh, post-presidential time to. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I remember reading also that it was really considered to be like a non partisan kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Non-political and uh, correct. correct. in order to refine the, the tone a little bit. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, speaking of that, we've gone through recently uh, a, a bad situation involving the government shutdown. And uh, we've seen... Uh, uh, we've seen a lot of brink, brinksmanship being played in politics in Washington, uh, uh, particularly, as I said before, the government shutdown, uh, the fact that the uh, a default was uh, put mm -hmm. on the table mm -hmm. almost as a bargaining chip. Yeah. Uh, do you think that this kind of Russian roulette is healthy uh, to be doing during a time when the economy is really trying to right itself. No, it's very, it's very unhealthy. And while the government shutdown itself probably doesn't have that much effect on the overall economy from a kind of technical point of view, mm -hmm. I think it shakes people's faith in um, the way our government operates and in that sense in the economy as well. So it's not a very good thing. There's a long tradition of uh, Congresses, especially if they are of the opposite party from the president, or one house is of the opposite party, trying to use uh, as leverage uh, the budget, a budget deadline, or even a uh, raising of the of the debt ceiling deadline. Um, but it's it's gotten to be very very unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Is the, I'm sure you would agree. Also, uh, this is jumping just a little bit because I know that you have. Uh, uh, that you've you've written, as I said before, mm -hmm. in the business section of the uh, of, of the Washington Post. But I, I'm sure you you would agree that the public's perception of the stock market has been shaken over the past mm -hmm. several years yeah. with everything that's been going on. Uh, make your best argument as to why people, especially like in the middle class, mm -hmm. uh, sh should ever believe in the stock market again after what they've seen. Sure. Well, I think the best argument is history. So I've written three books about personal investing. And what I tell people is that you really do need to invest, but only invest for the long haul. So why invest at all? Well, you know, history has shown that investing in the U.S. stock market with a diversified portfolio produces returns that are pretty high. I mean, they're in the area of, they've averaged nine or ten percent a year even after expenses so you know the doubling time if you, mm -hmm. if you put a thousand dollars in and you and it's nine percent a year every eight years it doubles so in 16 years you quadrupled your money there are no guarantees but the long-term history of the stock market is pretty uh, pretty solid mm -hmm. the problem is that the market goes up and down and the extremes are pretty difficult to deal with and so it takes um, a long-term perspective mm -hmm. and a certain amount of courage to stay in. And I think that's the kind of strategy that people need to 
to figure out, which is, is not like picking the right stocks. It's right. actually having the the courage and the fortitude to continue to invest even in difficult times. Well, you know, one of the books, as you well know, that you wrote in 2011 was called, and I have the title here, Safety Net, the Strategy for De-Risking Your Investments in a Time of, mm -hmm. uh, of Turbulence. Right, uh, right. De-risking, that's a pretty bold <laughs> term to use in connection with the stock market. Yeah, it is. I mean, you, you can't remove all risk, but there are ways to invest so that um, one investment or one kind of investment balances another. So one of the things that, the very simple f message in this book is that you need to protect yourself on the downside. So how can you invest so that you avoid a terrible year when you might lose 30 or 40 percent of your holdings, as people did in 2008? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that you need a mix of stocks and bonds and be diversified in both, and right. meaning you know, own mutual funds, own index mutual funds. And most people can do this fairly easily with their 401k plan or IRA. You may need some help uh, from a book like mine or from an advisor, mm -hmm. but the idea is you give up a little bit on the upside in order to protect yourself on the downside. That's the, the message of that book. Um, I, I really want to move uh, move ahead to your time as uh, mm -hmm. Under Secretary mm -hmm. of State, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I want to read something that uh, it's a quote from News, Newsweek, mm -hmm. and they, they were talking about you at the time, and they said, James K. Glassman has already been able to score small successes in the U.S. effort to win over hearts and minds in the Muslim world. Glassman has finally figured out how to sell the American idea abroad. How were you able to do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice to get good reviews from Newsweek. But, um, well, you know, that, that may be, that may exaggerate what mm. I did, but my job as, there are six different undersecretaries, and my job was what's called public diplomacy, which is the way that we relate to foreign publics. So mm. the you know, secretary is relating mainly to a foreign minister or presidents of other countries, but mm -hmm. I was trying to communicate America, tell America's story to a foreign public. So how do you do that? I think the one thing that, w that we came up with, which I think has been pretty effective, and the Obama administration has picked up on it, was don't preach to people. Don't tell people that we're the greatest and you should do what we tell you to do. Mm -hmm. But rather use our role as a convener or kind of a gatherer mm -hmm. of, of people and, uh, and a way to draw attention and, and be part of a broader conversation. So that's what we tried to do. And one of the great things about social media, like you know Facebook and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. is that it's perfectly made for that kind of communication. Mm -hmm. So a communication where we're not preaching, but we are part of a, a, a general conversation, but we get our message out. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so it's more a question of the means of communication rather than exactly what we're, we're, we're doing. You talk about social media, uh -huh. and I think that when we saw what was going on in Egypt, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it was the first time in my memory that such a huge movement, a uh, huge revolutionary movement, uh, was almost fueled by social media. Yeah, I think that's I think that's absolutely true, and um, it had it had a big impact, not a lasting impact. I mean, one of the one of the problems is that with the social media are all they are all they are, are means to communicate. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a good message first of all, right. and you have to have a broader strategy. And so, you know, Egypt, um, Egypt, no doubt, was made easier, the, the revolution against Mubarak, by social media. But then you've got to build a government, you've got to, you've got to have a constitution, you've got to do a lot of things that social media uh, are a little bit helpful, um, but not, not all that helpful. So I don't want to exaggerate the importance of it, but it really has changed uh, the ability of people to, to to build these kinds of movements. And when I was at the State Department, one of the things that we looked at very carefully and started to do was uh, mobilizing some of these movements, uh, not directing them, but kind of getting them together, especially young people's movements around mm -hmm. the world, mm -hmm. uh, anti-violence movements. And 
And um, we were pretty successful in places like uh, Colombia, for example, or Mexico against narco traffickers, and even in the Middle East as well. Hmm. Uh, staying on the Middle, uh, Middle East a little bit, if it hadn't been for the, uh, for the uh, government shutdown, uh, taking over the headlines, mm -hmm. we'd still be talking about Syria right, right. now. And to me, when you, when you take all the components of what's going on out there, uh, uh, Israel, uh, you've got Hezbollah, uh, up against their border, or, or, or the perceived threat of Hezbollah coming up against their border mm -hmm. uh, as a result of fighting uh, with the uh, Assad regime, mm -hmm. and uh, and of course you've you've got Benjamin Netanyahu who has to uh, please the Likud party uh, over there, and uh, also sees a visible threat, particularly when you see that map and how close everything is. Uh, all of these, all of these things are uh, seem to converge into something uh, pretty scary if you if you begin to add it up. I mean, the options are not great right. as to what's going on there. No, uh, I, I agree with that, and I think that I think uh, so far Syria has been a failure of American foreign policy. Um, it is a very important place in the world strategically because Iran. Is, uh, has a lot of influence over Syria, mm -hmm. to say the least. Yeah. And Iran is the most destabilizing force in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And it's not just Iran's opposition to Israel, it's Iran's opposition to Sunni um, Arab states like, uh, like Saudi Arabia or the Gulf states, you know, places like um, Dubai and uh, Abu Dhabi. They're, they feel very threatened by uh, by Iran. Iran now has quite a bit of influence in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And so so the uprising against Assad uh, a little over two years ago was actually quite an opportunity for the United States, an amazing opportunity. This is a democratic uprising. Mm -hmm. And it was something that, in my view, we should have supported, not with troops, but in other ways. Mm -hmm. And we dithered for a long time. Uh, I recently read a very interesting story in the New York Times it's, which really kind of recounted the entire policy, our policy making um, history on Syria and it's not, it's, it's not a very good one. Mm -hmm. And so we spent a long time trying to figure out what to do, the White House did, and by the time a decision was made, oh, we've got to stop them from getting, uh, from getting chemical weapons. Um, we really didn't do anything about them getting chemical weapons. Mm. And we knew as early as April of, of this year, 2013, that they were using chemical weapons. And uh, in my view, should have tried to put a stop to it because that would have at least probably would have prevented 1,400 people, you know, many of, many of whom were children, from dying. But more important, um, Iran is in the ascendancy now. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult at this point for us, for the United States, to have much of a, uh, of a role in Syria because the, the uprising is now fragmented, the, mm -hmm. the rebels are now in, in some, some places dominated right. by, by, by radicals that, that we don't like, right. Al-Qaeda affiliates. That's so we've got, we got a real problem. Sure. And, and, and if it had been addressed two and a half years ago, it wouldn't be the problem that it is today. Well, that dilemma... Uh, you know, of, of who to support on the ground. I mean, because we hear reports of Al-Qaeda, you know, getting uh, influence uh, mm -hmm. with some of the rebel groups. Uh, um, I'll never forget that uh, Senator, uh, Senator McCain went over there and uh, he, picked a, uh, uh, he picked a particular rebel group to stand shoulder to shoulder with, only to find out he was having his photograph taken with somebody who had known terrorist ties. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, it, right. It, it, it it's seems, a difficult situation. It's but, a Hobson's choice, it seems. Right. But yeah. at the very least, the United States should stand against any country that uses chemical weapons. That is a, that is a clear line that President Obama himself drew and that, that, that we drew you know, decades ago in treaties. And uh, to get that, that kind of thing started, there's a, 
that, that's a, a, a very dim future for the entire world if people mm -hmm. start using chemical weapons as they did during World War II and have sporadically done since. So I don't think there's any doubt where we should stand. President Obama mm -hmm. has also said that he wants Assad out. And, but the question, but as you say, it's become much more complicated mm -hmm. now that there's been this fragmentation of the rebels. And, you know, we would not be in this situation if Iran or Syria, Assad would not be in this situation if he were not getting as much support as he's been getting from Iran, from Hezbollah troops mm -hmm. being in Syria. And uh, that's something we never should have allowed. Mm -hmm. We should have tried to put a stop to it earlier. Uh, you, you know, diplomacy is not my field, but I've known since, eight, uh, since I was 18 years old that the use of sarin is a war crime. Mm -hmm. And uh, the minute it was discovered that, uh, that uh, Assad had uh, done that, mm -hmm. and the French, I believe, had evidence uh, that uh, could also uh, uh, verify that, the president turned around and said that he was going to ask Congress. He was going to, going to right. consult with Congress, right. which told me at, at that point nothing was going to happen because right. uh, because of the political situation right. at this point. He had every right as as commander in chief to go in without the Congress. He did. No, I, I don't think there's anyone who would argue differently, and and he wouldn't even argue differently. What he what he was saying was it kind of gives him a stronger position and so forth. But no, I. I think his going to Congress was just another manifestation of his ambivalence. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really know what he wants to do there, and we haven't quite figured it out for a long time. And uh, by taking the position he ended up taking in, in Syria, he's alienated a lot of our very important allies, including uh, the countries, Arab countries in the Middle East, mm -hmm. which have stood against Iran and have been uh, pretty pretty strong on, on, on a lot of things that are important to us, Jordan, fighting France, terror. Jordan. Jordan is one, yeah. Saudi Arabia is another one. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in a way, Vladimir Putin kind of helped him out of this mess, but in another way, it raised Putin's own standing around the world and harmed us with our friends. And the other point, which you, which you made earlier, is something I, I really feel very strongly about. You know, when... Um, when Assad used these weapons against his own people, there are a couple of remedies that we should have been looking at. One was we wanted to never do it again, mm -hmm. that's for sure. And another is, however, that we haven't addressed, is that he really needs to pay in some way mm -hmm. for having done this. It is a war crime, as you say. Mm -hmm. So as far as the never using it again part, apparently if this, if, if this disarmament uh, plan of the Russians goes uh, forward, and I'm somewhat skeptical about it, but if, that would be fine. That, that, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But the other part of it, we haven't addressed at all. Mm -hmm. And of course, view, looking at this whole thing is Israel. Mm -hmm. And you've got uh, Benjamin, uh, ben Benjamin uh, uh, Netanyahu right. who's sitting there. And, and, uh, and one of the things I was talking to somebody is, is when you sit down and look at the geography yeah. of Israel, uh, where it is in mm -hmm. relationship to Syria, where it is in relationship to Iran and all of this. It's, it's like looking at a map of the Mid-South and looking at something that's only happening a, another county away. Right, right. No, no it's, it's yeah. true. I mean, Syria is like a suburb to Memphis. Memphis is Israel. Syria is a suburb. I mean, it's, it, everything's pretty darn close. There's no doubt about it. And, and as a result, the urgency of Netanyahu to act is even more... Uh, it seems to be more of a, a of a growing uh, situation every day. Uh, if it looks as if the president goes in and begins to talk to this new leader in Iran, mm -hmm. um, and Netanyahu has to play the game of of going along with this and listening to mm -hmm. promises that he might make. Right. Although his political advisors will tell him something else, uh, wouldn't you imagine that President Obama is going to be under a lot of pressure not to talk to the uh, to the head of Iran on this thing because um, of because of Israel? I think it's I think it's very complicated. Yeah. I don't think that the Israelis are going to be able to dictate to Obama uh, on the subject of whether he's going to talk to Iran. 
Yeah. I think Obama, the President Obama sees the possibility that we could disarm Iran or stop the Iranians from getting a nuclear weapon, which has been the number one foreign policy objective for his administration and for a, a very high one anyway for the one that I served under. So, so if that's possible, he's going to try to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the Israelis are in a, a difficult position um, because of this sort of this peace offensive by the Iranians. Um, it makes their own concerns uh, and even their kind of bellicose statements mm -hmm. uh, ring a little bit hollow. So people saying, we, saying to them, oh, you know, calm down. Here are the Iranians. They're making nice. We should hear them out. Mm -hmm. um, so you could kind of argue it either way. The Israelis are gonna, just going to have to wait, see how this plays out, because they had, if, they act, if they attacked Iran now, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have much support. Uh, whereas six months ago, they would have had a lot of support. Right. On the other hand, the other side of this question is, uh, six months ago, perhaps, they, they would have thought that the United States uh, would take care of the Iranian situation mm -hmm. in the way they wanted it taken care of. Now they have, I don't think they have any hope that that's going to happen. So, so it's kind of touchy. I mean, I can certainly see if the Iranians attacked Iran tomorrow, Mm -hmm. and tried to take out their, their nuclear uh, weapons development uh, uh, situation, I, I wouldn't be all that shocked. No. On the other hand, it's probably less likely than it would have been before the Iranian peace offensive. But if that fails, then it may I, be more likely. I have been amazed that, that Netanyahu hasn't done anything yeah. A, yeah. as yet, you know, uh, because that's, that's just something that... Uh, that, she, that in the past the, the Israelis have, have reacted to. Yeah. Um, the situation as it stands uh, in, in the Middle East, as we were as we were talking before about the geography of it, uh, uh, politically, I uh, in looking at at Prime Minister Net, Netanyahu, I I've had this discussion with friends. He always struck me as being somebody who was not quite the best peacetime prime minister, but in a sense like Churchill, he would be uh, a, good, a good crisis prime minister. I mean, that was, that was the read I had. As somebody who's an amateur has just mm -hmm. watched him from afar, mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your read on ben, Benjamin Netanyahu? Well, I think what you say is probably true. Uh, the one of the things that people don't know about him is that he became very interested in uh, economics not too many years ago. Mm -hmm. And when he was economics minister, did a very good job of helping to get the uh, Israeli economy uh, much more on a kind of free market, um, kind of entrepreneurial mm -hmm. basis. And the Israeli economy is doing very well. So I wouldn't say that you know, he, he, he would only be a, a wartime, uh, do well as a wartime mm -hmm. prime minister. Surprisingly enough, right. he's actually pretty good in, in other areas. Um, you know, I think so. Was, the was, Churchill analogy doesn't hold water. Well, really. well <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I actually don't know what Churchill did on the economic front. Um, yeah. But you know he's he, he's obviously a very controversial figure mm -hmm. in Israel. He has enough support to be to lead the country. But right. but um, I think he's he's always uh, one of the great things about a democracy is there are lots of views represented. Uh, Israeli Israel is a very vigorous democracy, and I think that uh, if he if his tendency is to be kind of more warlike, uh, the 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 left or others are kind of pull him back toward the center. Mm -hmm. So he's not completely free to do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. And he, he, I think he really reflects what the Israeli people want. And the Israeli people are, are pretty frightened by a country that says that it, whose leaders, at least not, in the not too distant past, said they wanted to destroy it. So. Yeah. Well, uh, in the couple of minutes that we have left, it's just fl flown by. But uh, uh, I want to ask you uh, your impressions of a couple of uh, a couple of uh, uh, at least one leader, and that is uh, Vladimir Putin, mm -hmm. a former KGB guy. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely looks like a former KGB mm -hmm. guy when he walks down the ramp. Right. Uh, 
is it, it's so bizarre because you almost see a, a Cold War mentality with uh, with Putin. Mm -hmm. uh, what, are we ever going to get past that with the, with this man? Well, the first thing I would say about him is don't underestimate him. Mm -hmm. He is he he may sometimes act like a, a thug, but he's pretty sophisticated as far as the way he deals diplomatically. You know, Russia just, I mean, Russia's got a lot of oil and natural gas, but really they're not a major player when it comes to, um, when it comes to the military, mm -hmm. when it really, when, when it comes to uh, the economy. And they really are a developing nation. You know, they're lumped together with, with Brazil and uh, India and so forth. So, but he has made himself a much bigger player on the world stage. And partly because he's kind of resurrected the Cold War, which has made some countries afraid of him. That's also helped him internally, because mm -hmm. the Russians are very nationalistic. Yeah. But he's also been quite clever, as, he, as he's shown in, in Syria. And he has really gained from this, this Syrian episode, not just in the Middle East, but also in Asia and other parts of the world. Well, Ambassador James Glassman, I really do appreciate you being on the program today. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.